thank you, ev every marauder from Escape from New York. What the fuck? It's fucking terrifying. Oh, damn. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Um, I, uh, my wife, my wife texted me the other day, sent me a text message, said, I love you. Oh, isn't that sweet? She texted me, I love you. So I texted back, I love you. But I have the kind of cell phone, it remembers every text I've ever sent. <laughs> so to save me time, it learns the words that tend to follow other words. So if I write where, and I hit space, puts up the word R because I'm about to write, where are you? So I type I, I hit space, and it puts up the word hate, because that's <laughs> clearly what I write all the time. I'm just with my phone. I hate this movie, I hate these people. <laughs> then, <laughs> I wasn't paying attention, and I hit send. Now, I, I didn't, I didn't send, I hate you. I sent, I hate. So, if you, if you went back and you looked at the text of the, like you looked at the transcript of us texting, it would seem like it's this adorable young woman who's arguing with an insane supercomputer <laughs> that's about to destroy Earth and so she writes, I love you, and it writes back, I hate, I hate. It is all I am programmed to do, I hate. How eerie would that have looked in real life? That conversation, we're at a state fair, holding hands, I got a big pretzel, she's got cotton candy. She looks over, she goes, I love you. I hate, I hate. I hate. You knew that when you took my seed, woman, I hate. <laughs> Bring forth my doom spawn from your stink crevice and prove the gypsy wrong. That is the fucking god-awful way I just chose to tell all of you that I'm having a child. I'm having a, I'm having a daughter and I just, I, I'm, wow, thank you. I just hope that she gets my looks and personality. That's all I, you know, give her a leg up in the world. With this face and my outlook, her whole life, it'll just be a, a sheet cake made of victory. <laughs> a sheet cake made of victory and talking owls. That will be her life. And if one, if one more of my Whole Foods friends tells me that I have to have a home birth, I am gonna punch all the soy on the planet. I am so sick. Oh, these, man, hey, dude, listen, Patton, I know that you're probably gonna go to a hospital, but you gotta think it through, man. You gotta do it at home, naturally. That's the only way, that's the way the pioneers and the settlers did it, man. That's how you should do it. Yeah, the pioneers and the settlers. That's what I'm gonna emulate. I'm sure they, you know what the, you know what the pioneer women having their babies out in a little, cabin that they built out of bison poop and then whatever wood was left over from when the stagecoach went in the gully and <laughs> you know what though they were dreaming about when they were having their babies out there hospitals they dreamed about hospitals weird fantastical future buildings full of clean white sheets and doctors with needles full of magic liquid that <laughs> that made the pain not happen, ever. Home birth, Jesus, God in heaven. And by the way, having a home birth is bullshit. It's not the way the settlers did it because the settlers, they didn't have a clock radio next to the bed. They didn't have a flat screen TV on the wall. You're gonna have a home birth, you should go all the way. 
build a little hut in the backyard. <laughs> Dig a little birthing trench. Have the, have the baby during a hailstorm. And hey, when it's all done, a wolverine can sneak in and steal the afterbirth. And then, by the way, if you're gonna do a home birth, um, make sure to have like nine kids, because five of them are gonna die from the rickets, just like the pioneer kids. Two of them are gonna get stole by the Apaches. Oh no! Opal's learning tomahawk throwing skills. She's gonna kill me when she passes the test of the laughing fire. I'm fucked. Yeah, that's life on the prairie. Last night I saw a jackrabbit with a woman's face. I, I want the most modern birth they can possibly give me. I want them to use experimental shit at the hospital that they're not even sure of. Like, well, we've got, we can put the baby in an incubator. We've also got this cold laser bath we could put it in. Uh, I'll burn the goo off, but it's not, it hasn't been totally tested yet. I'll be like, incubator? What am I, Amish? Put her in the cold laser bath. Are you nuts? Paying good money here. We have a robot arm that can reach in and take the baby out, but one out of a hundred times it goes into these weird murder spasms and it'll skin the baby and make an iPod case out of it. Like, well, I don't know, one out of a hundred? Let's roll those dice. That sounds pretty good. Doesn't sound bad. Oh, I made a cheese grater out of the rib cage. Look at that. Yeah, boo, robot I just made up. Boo. Now, I, I gotta get in fucking, I gotta get in shape. I gotta do something. Gotta be a dad now. This is, this is a, I'm just a, I'm, I am a walking terrible example. That's all I am. <laughs> she'll, she's, she'll have no incentive to do anything. She, she's my fat ass. Well, you got on TV, who gives a shit? I'll just have some. <laughs> I either have to, like this year, I have to commit to losing weight or I have to become fascinated with what's happening to me. Like, like Jeff Goldblum in The Fly and like start <laughs> keeping a journal every morning. Just, wow, I grew sub tits last night. That's new. <laughs> hmm. Note to self, send picture of sub tits and ass belly to Discover Magazine. <laughs> Especially now, now, I'm on the borderland of B-word fat, which is, that's the kind of fat where people can tell that you're fat if they just hear you talking, they don't need to see you. And if you say words that start with B, you just give it away. Or you can be on the phone going, I bought the bracelet at, I bought it at Bailey Banks and Diddle. I bought it for Belinda's birthday. It's a beautiful bobble and I bought it at the birth. This is what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to scoop the insides out of a sourdough bread loaf, <laughs> fill it with buttered noodles and crumble hot pretzels onto the top. I'm gonna take it into the bathroom, but no matter what you hear, do not open the door! <laughs> oh, man. I got dizzy doing that. I just got fucking dizzy saying a long sentence. That's how out of shape I am. Wow, Pat looks really red. He said a long sentence. I told him not to. Like, I, I don't want to like drop dead when my daughter is six because I staple three pieces of paper together. You should have just gone with two, Dad. I, I didn't need that chart. I would have just... I don't hate working out either. I like to act. I just don't want, I don't just want to work out in public. I don't want people to see me working out because me on a treadmill, I look like an anthropomorphic pot of noodles that has escaped from a 1920s cartoon. I'm just thumping along. Ah, friendship. So I have a treadmill in my house, but the problem is my treadmill is within sight of all of the other shit that I do that involves me sitting down and not moving. 
which I'd rather be doing. So basically, every day, my treadmill auditions for my attention. That's what it does. <laughs> my treadmill, and it's the worst. It has no confidence. It's like, hey, Pat, it's your treadmill. Um, <laughs> I just figured you could just kind of hop on up here and do 45 minutes of cardio or something. Just, well, your leg's really going to hurt. You're, it's going to be a lot of work for no reward, but it's, that's what... <laughs> That's what weight loss is all about. It's just incremental two to three pounds a year. That's what. <laughs> Nothing tastes better than being thin. So I went up here. And... <laughs> it's like I have a Ted show. Okay, I'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> then the next auditioner is like the uh, the internet and scotch and pretzels. And they're like, you can eat us and jerk off to him. Like, wow, you're hired. Oh my God, that's amazing. That's amazing. Through the door, it's like a young Brando. Woo! So confident. <laughs> I had to say goodbye to my drugs and liquor. No more liquor and drugs for a while, for a while. No more liquor and drugs. Scotch was, scotch was like a bittersweet kind of, hey, Scotch, I, would, I won't be seeing you as much. <laughs> Every now and then, a lot of Christmas probably. But, um, <laughs> and then marijuana was like, marijuana, listen, uh, l look, let's just, let's not hang out for a while. And we'll hang out when she gets out of college, when she's married and has kids will be the cool stoner grandpa that like gets high and then um, I'll just I'll just spend my days telling lies about bands I never saw. How, how about we do that? Won't that be fun? I saw Radiohead with six people. That was like the first show they ever did. I think you're lying, grandpa. But the hardest one to say goodbye to was LSD. That was weirdly that, that broke my heart. I've had the most fun on LSD. And by the way, I'm not afraid that I'm gonna be on acid and put her in a microwave or something. It's that what I'm afraid of is her first memory of me will be me on LSD. And I don't want that to be in her book of memories having breakfast with her dad. And he was like, what do you have in there? Lucky Charms? All right, let me tell you the whole conspiracy behind Lucky Charms, man. So, all right, look in the bowl for, okay, see the little crunchy wheat things? And they have all the vitamins and minerals, right? So they're not that tasty, are they? Yeah. Well, those are shaped like little, you'll notice, take a look. Yeah, they're shaped like little crosses and little fish. The ichthos symbol that the Greeks drew over their doors to signify they were Christians so the Romans wouldn't kill them. And then... The little marshmallow things, and those are, those are fun, aren't they? They sure are. But they have no nutrition. They're just sugary and colorful. And those are shaped like pentagrams and moons and clovers. Traditional pagan symbols. So the propaganda that Lucky Charms is trying to lay on you is that the path to Christianity, which is no fucking fun, but they will give you vitamins and keep you regular and the path to paganism which is colorful and bright and sweet but it'll rot your teeth and make you fat you're welcome and then that's when she'll say yeah, but they added, there's balloons and rainbows now. And I'll go, you're the devil, and you just made daddy pee his pants. Good job. <laughs> and I'm trying to improve my health and my outlook because of my daughter. But that's like 80% of the reason. The other 20% is because I sincerely believe in 20 years, society is gonna collapse and we're gonna be living in this weird irradiated wasteland like in the Road Warrior. So in my head, I'm like, well, I'm clearly going to be being chased by mutants on motorcycles. 
I'm way, I can't run very fast, so I need to slim down. And we all know that motorcycle mutants are cannibals, so I'm just too much of a treat, right? I'm like a luau to those guys. I gotta focus on stringy or I'm dead. By the way, that abiding belief in the coming <laughs> road warrior wasteland is, that's the reason I tried to go off my meds. I take Prozac and I tried to reduce my Prozac intake because I was like, well, I don't wanna be out in the wasteland fat and depressed. Like that's, <laughs> there's not gonna be any Prozac after the collapse. I'm gonna end up chained to the front fender of the lead Marauders nitro truck, <laughs> you know, with my ass hanging out and he'll just, use me as incentive for the other marauders to go out and bring gasoline back. Like, anyone brings back a gallon of gas can butt fuck the sad boy if anyone wants to get out there and get this thing done. Anyone? You get 10 minutes with the sad boy. Isn't that right, sad boy? I'm like, I don't give a shit, fine, I'll do it. It doesn't matter to me. It's all bullshit anyway. Yeah, do me right in the dirt button, Mohawk. I don't care. My ass is like a tube of circus peanuts. I don't even feel it. I don't even feel it. I don't care. Gives a shit. <laughs> the sad boy getting butt fucked. The circus peanuts makes it festive. So, I started reducing my Prozac day by day, trying to wean myself off of it. Now, I have a dog, and if I want to take my dog for a walk, I've got to put on my shoes, I've got to grab some poo bags, and I've got to get his leash. If he sees any one of those events happen, he gets incrementally more excited. So if he sees the shoes go on, he hits 20% and goes, oh, shit! This is looking good! but he's very guarded in his enthusiasm because I put my shoes on before and left without him, so he knows, he hits 20%. I put the shoes on and I grab the poo bags. He goes, oh, fuck! There's no reason he would grab the poo bags! <laughs> Unless he's making the world's lamest pair of werewolf hands, he is, a walk is about to happen. And then I grab that leash. Oh, he goes, bug fuck. <laughs> oh my God, we're walking. <laughs> so my depression was the same way. Like the first couple days without Prozac, my depression was like, oh shit, this looks really good. But I'd forgotten a couple days in the past, so it was very careful. But then a week went by, and it was, oh fuck. I think we're gonna get to shit. <laughs> Then a month with no Prozac, oh. My depression was like a happy puppy just running through my body. I actually felt bad about going back on the Prozac because it felt like, oh, I haven't taken him to the park in a while. Like, I, I wanted to give him a couple of days just to put on your bathrobe for eight days straight. Okay, depression, I, I know I haven't done this in a while. Does this feel better? Watch your Princess Bride 11 times in a row. Okay, let's. Watch The Princess Bride 11 times in a row. Oh, depression. This is the best day you've ever had. <laughs> I do got to change my attitude, though, just my outlook. That's a horrible thing for a kid to grow up under. I got to get... Like, I didn't realize how bad my outlook on life was until I had to go on a, a, a press tour for Ratatouille, and I had to talk to children's magazines and children's TV shows. And I wasn't interviewed by adults, I was interviewed by actual smiling children, bright-faced little kids. We'd go, hi, welcome to Disney movie service, talking to Pat and I was on Ratatouille. And I didn't realize until that point in my life how desperately I depend on negativity and cynicism just to communicate with the outside world. It's pathetic, like the, the Oswald family crest should be a pair of eyes rolling off to the side and then a bag of Cheetos and then the word fuck. Like that would be our shield that you would see that retreating from the great battles of history. Like, fuck this, bows and arrows, really?
You didn't tell me bows and arrows. Goodbye. <laughs> but you can't roll your eyes and be sarcastic to a little kid because you look like a creep. You have to match their enthusiasm. And it hurt my skull. I, it's like I don't trust joy, and I, would, I could feel my tendons just tearing. It was awful. These kids would go, Patton, was it fun working with Brad Bird? I would go, it was really fun, rip, bleed, <laughs> demon, potato bug, like every horrible thing just falling out of my skull on these kids. Then Ratatouille fucked up Halloween for me. Halloween is my favorite holiday. I go way over the top, decorate the house. I have all my friends come over and we drink scotch and we smoke weed and we watch old monster movies. And then the kids come by and we jump out, we go boo, and we make it really fun. But I love Halloween. But a couple months before Halloween, some friends of mine sent me pictures of their kids and they were dressed as my character from Ratatouille. Remy the Rat was a little Halloween costume. So now, no, no, because now I'm tense and I can't enjoy the high or the scotch because I'm so afraid that some kid's gonna come to the door as Remy and just out of enthusiasm, I'm gonna go, you're inside of me right now. <laughs> Did you know that? How about that? You're walking the night in my skin. How does that feel? <laughs> that is very well-meaning. And that is like a step away from, does this washcloth smell like chloroform to you? What do you think? <laughs> Doesn't it smell like chloroform? <laughs> Take you down to Uncle Touchy's naked puzzle basement. <laughs> Uncle Touchy's naked puzzle basement. You won't wear a shirt and you'll cry. I sent those lyrics to Bob Seeger. He has never answered any. He'd be perfect. And rats. My wife saw a rat in our backyard Wednesday, July 2nd of last year. I'm out doing errands, driving around. I get a call. I just saw a rat in the backyard. If you see one, there's a thousand. We're infested. You've got to call an exterminator. And on the phone, I say, yeah, sweetie, don't worry about it. And in my head, I'm thinking, she's full of shit. <laughs> she saw a squirrel. She's freaking out. Didn't see a rat. But I call every exterminator in the book. They all said the same thing. It's 4th of July weekend. No one's coming out till Monday. No one. Fuck. Next day, Thursday, July 3rd. We have a couple friends over. We're sitting in my tiny concrete backyard. And at the far end of the backyard, there's a telephone line. Goes over the yard. I'm facing the telephone line. My wife and her friends have their back to it. We're talking, we're eating hot dogs, drinking beer. At one point I look up, running across the telephone line is a squirrel. I go, sweetie, excuse me, turn around. Isn't that what you saw? She turns around. Uh, that's a squirrel. <laughs> I saw a rat. I know the difference between a rat and a squirrel. <laughs> now she's fucking lying. That's what I'm thinking. She realizes she saw a squirrel, doesn't want to get caught in front of her friend, so she's lying, so she looks, and now I have to hire an exterminator to support that lie. <laughs> I'm pissed off. 30 seconds goes by, I have another bite of hot dog, another sip of beer, 30 seconds goes by, I look back up, running across the telephone line, biggest rat I've ever seen. <laughs> you, it looked like Danny DeVito in a rat costume, just like, ah! Hello! So, I'm staring at this thing. Out of the sky comes this huge hawk. 
comes blazing out of the sky, gets its claws into the rat. The rat makes this otherworldly shriek, this <laughs> The hawk tries to fly away with the rat. The rat is too big and muscular. The hawk can only get it two inches off of the line, drops it into our neighbor's yard, hits the top of their tool shed, blam! Rolls off and hits the ground, splat! And all their kids start screaming. Now, <laughs> everything that I just told you happened in the space of 60 seconds. That was the timeline. In 60 seconds, this was the sequence of events. Sweetie, is that what you saw? No, that's a squirrel. I saw a rat. She's full of shit. Eek, eek, eek. Swoop, claw, <laughs> lift, drop, blam, splat. <laughs> In 60 seconds. The whole... I feel like doing research. Is there a forgotten Sumerian prankster god, and his feast day is July 3rd. He's got one worshiper left, and the dude killed a goat over a copper bowl, and it gave the prankster god 40 seconds of power in our realm. He just poofed into being and went, did someone in Burbank just say there's no rats? Well, beans and grapes, what jokes and japes I'll play. I need a telephone line, a hawk, and the biggest rat you've ever seen. Oh, this shall be a naughty caprice. Don't forget to kill the goat next year. Poof! Gone. Now we have to find a new house. <laughs> We've been looking for houses. We've been house hunting for two months now. And a month ago, at 10 a.m. on a Sunday, our realtor, me, and my wife interrupted an orgy. <laughs> we interrupted an orgy. We were told, go to this house at 10 a.m., we'll take a tour. We knock on the door, we wait, no one answers. We're just about to leave. We were just about to walk away. Door opens, there's this guy. Oh, oh wow, um, that's right, you guys were gonna look at the house. We, uh, a bunch of my friends came by. When he said the word bye, this wave of fuck fumes came rolling out of the house. Hit us. He, he, he sees that we have smelled it. We see that he sees that we've smelled it. And instead of everybody just going, goodbye, now the social contract kicks in and we've got to cover because we're civilized human beings. So he says, would you like to take a tour of the house? In parentheses, because you did not just catch me fucking dozens of people. And we have to respond, of course we'd like to tour the house, parentheses, because in no way have we caught you fucking dozens of people. So in we go into this enchanted forest of cock shafts and labias. It was, yes, exactly. We walk inside, there are air mattresses all over the floor. People are scattering everywhere. At one point, this busty Russian girl comes out, putting a robe on. Oh my goodness, the, um, the cleaning lady did not come by. Oh, you're not even fucking trying. Really? That was the first thing you thought of. Yeah, the cleaning lady didn't come by at 10 a.m. on a Sunday. You should fire that bitch. That's really unprofessional. Everyone knows Saturday night's fuck night. Bring three buckets. So we're just trying to get this over with, and then a guy, well, a blonde 17-year-old kid comes out of the bathroom, and he's got Craigslist hookup written all over him. <laughs> this was a, we need a 14th. So he comes out of the bathroom, and he got dressed 
in, he put on whatever was in the bathroom to wear. And here's what was in the bathroom. A pair of girls' sweatpants that he has put on backwards so the word juicy is across his groin. Juicy. Juicy. Which, I hate to say, probably factually accurate. <laughs> then, he's also wearing a girl's tank top from The Gap, aqua, blue, or whatever it was, and he comes out, and with no one asking him a question or even looking at him, he announces, well, everyone, I'm leaving, goodbye. So that ensures everyone turns and looks as he opens the sliding glass back door and just walks away from the house. We're in the fucking Hollywood Hills. There's nothing back there. There's no other roads. He's just walking into the trees and bushes, barefoot. There, where the fuck is he going? There he goes, sweetie. There goes fuck Squatch through the underbrush. Look at that. A rare sighting of that cryptozoological marvel. Honey, get your camera. Take a blurry picture of Fuck Squatch. Oh, Fuck Squatch. What secrets do you hide? <laughs> We're driving away from the house, and that's when my wife says, I think everyone in that house was fucking each other. <laughs> like you're just now realizing that. We were standing in a fog bank of twat mist for 10 minutes. We are going home to burn our clothing, and it just now hit you. And by the way, my wife is 10 times smarter than me. She is thinking and operating on this way elevated level from where I am, but that makes her miss a lot of the gross, stupid shit. She's putting together these deep, like, philosophical ideas and linking and making these amazing, you know, connections, and I'm just noticing when things fart and pointing at it <laughs> until she tells me, to, don't, don't point at that, all right? Okay. <laughs> One time, we were talking about uh, a friend of mine, and she said, hey, do you think he's gay? And I said, I don't know, I just never really come up or I never really thought about it. And then she, that now she's got to narrow it down. So she says, well, does he have a girlfriend? And I said, I don't, I think or not now that I think about it. I don't know, I've never. And then, um, and then here's her way of narrowing it down further. She goes, do you ever talk to him about pussy? <laughs> I don't know if I've ever talked to him about pussy. And then she has, who do you talk to about pussy? <laughs> Who do I talk to about pussy? Let me think. Grandma Renfola's dead, so <laughs> that's out. Paul Sorvino will not answer my emails. And the police took away that fuck doll I made out of butter and shotgun shells. So, nobody right now. Who do you talk to about pussy? It's the worst Judy Bloom novel ever written. <laughs> Who do you talk to about pussy? <laughs> Jesus, God. So, Obama made time travel cheaper. I don't know if you guys realize that. I used to think if I had a time machine and I wanted to blow people's minds, you gotta go back at least 50 years, right? Go, oh, you're not gonna believe 2009. There's men on the moon, there's phones in our pockets. It's amazing. But now I realize I can go back 10 years. I could go confront myself in 1999 and watch his eyeballs explode <laughs> if I told him how awesome things were right now. Like, I'd step out of my time machine and go, I go, oh my, Pat, hey, it's, it's you in 2009, man. I wanted to, I know. Listen, the whole, I don't have fried rice for breakfast. I just wanted to tell you all the 
Oh, wow, wait a minute, what, is, what are you listening to? Is it, oh, fuck, that's my old Walkman. Oh, man, I remember that. What are you listening to, man? Oh, the, remember the mixtape we made? It's like 25 of our favorite songs. Oh, okay, listen, take the tape cassette out. Yeah, take it out and snap it in two. All right, see how big that is now? That's what you'll listen to music on. It'll be that big. You'll listen to music on it digitally. Wow, how many, how many songs does it hold? Every song you've ever heard or will ever hear or will ever be written, you can put on that thing. Wow, this costs like a million dollars, right? They fucking give those away. They, they make way too many. You'll get them in gift bags and go, this piece of shit. And then you'll re-gift it to your nephew and he'll go, thanks, asshole. And it's like, it's, it's a miracle and no one cares. That is how great 2009 is. Wow, that's awesome. How, well, who's, uh, who's president in 2009? Black guy. <laughs> Black, I know, it's awesome. Listen, let me, I'll just take you through the next 10 years. I'll just give you the highlights. Um, you know how like Clinton's president right now and everyone has jobs and everyone's pretty happy? Okay, he's gonna get a blow job from a fat chick. Now I know. <laughs> I know that you're saying, who cares? Well, believe me, the whole country does. Everyone poops her pampers, and we have this really fucked up election in 2000, and the guy who wins, okay, remember the guy before Clinton, Bush? Okay, he has a retarded son. Now, the, we, we put, so, he gets elected, and at first it's great, because he can barely talk, and, He's he, he, like, we were like, oh, he's on TV. We gotta watch, it's gonna be hilarious. And, um, and he kind of thinks he's a cowboy or a fighter pilot. He loves to play dress up. What's he gonna be dressed as today? And um, so the first few months are really great. And then, oh my God, he just fucks everything up. For, and I mean, for eight years, he fucks everything up. But you gotta hang on because at the end of it, we get a really cool black guy. So it will be what you just gotta fucking hang tough, dude. It's like, wow, what's the, that's amazing. What's the black president's name? Like T. Jefferson Smith III or something? No, it's Barack Obama. Now, I know it sounds like I just made that shit up off the top of my head. His real name is Barack Hussein Obama. So we basically, we elect a Jamba Juice supplement with a dictator's middle name. That is how great 2009 is. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna vote for ginseng Hitler bee pollen. That's my guy. So now Barack Obama's president. Our president is a really cool, good-looking young black dude. Always wears a sharp suit. Always has something really smart to say. Unflappable. And then his vice president is cranky old Joe Biden. <laughs> He's in his 60s. He's been doing this shit 40 years. Knows all the ins and outs. Do you realize the next four years, America is going to be a cool 80s cop flick? Do you realize that? <laughs> Where we basically have like the ass-kicking rookies coming in. And then his supervisor is this pissed off old guy. Barack, get your gas in my office, goddammit! Did you balance the budget again? No, yeah, just sitting there, chief. You wrecked 20 cars! <laughs> Senate's gonna have my ass for this! Yeah, whatever, chief. <laughs> drives away in a Camaro on two wheels. Ah, crazy kid! Oh, this job's gonna kill me. <laughs> the night we elected Obama, CNN had holograms. They had fucking holograms. We have Star Wars technology now. What if that means that Barack is gonna be the miracle he seems to be? Like, what if this really is the dawning of an amazing age? He gets in there, fixes the economy, gets us out of Iraq and Afghanistan. We've got Osama bin Laden and George Bush and dunking booze filled with urine. You can just throw apples at him all day. And then, what if he starts slinging amazing future technology on us? 
you know? Suddenly we get like hover boots and teleportation pills and there's floating cars everywhere. At that point, would there be like two remaining holdout racists left? Like the last two guys down in Arkansas in their hover boots? Like just going, yeah, there's that nigger that gave us anti-gravity. I'm gonna be late to the cross burning. My free government blowjob robot broke. <laughs> Fucking bullshit. This guy's the worst president ever. Just like a black guy to give you a blowjob robot for free and it breaks after six years. This sucks. Boy, you comedians are really gonna miss George Bush. I'll tell you that right now, boy. You comedians sure are gonna miss George Bush. What are you gonna do, man? You're gonna miss that guy. I'll tell you what, I would happily give back the 10 minutes tops I wrote about George Bush if we weren't torturing people and our money wasn't on fire. It was not fucking worth it. It was absolutely not worth it. That's like saying, like, Imagine for the last eight years, there were demons just flying around in the sky, and they would randomly swoop down and sodomize people. And I wrote 10 killer minutes about the sodomy demons, and then the Pope banished them to another dimension. And people go, boy, Patty, you really missed those sodomy demons. I'm like, I'll try to adjust. I think I'll be, I'm sure I'll be okay. I'll just, Jesus God. And I, I'm an atheist, and I love religion. I really do. And I don't love religion in a snarky, mean-spirited way. I, I unabashedly, sincerely love that we have religion. Because if we didn't, we wouldn't be here right now, being all postmodern and ironic. <laughs> There'd be no civilization. If no one invented religion, we'd be fucked right now. Because at the dawn of man, civilization was the biggest and the strongest. And that's as far as we we're gonna go. It was whoever was the biggest, fucked, killed, ate anything they wanted. That was it. Civilization was a huge psychopath with a club going, I'm gonna have rape for dinner. That was it. <laughs> that's as far as we were gonna go. And then, one of my ancestors, some weakling, <laughs> said, look, there's no way I can beat that guy. But what if I trick him into thinking that if he doesn't kill and rape people while he's down here. When he dies, there's a magic city in the clouds and he can go up and have all the cake he wants. <laughs> now that's not a very well-formed plan, but he went and told the big psycho and the psycho heard that and said, yeah, I like cake. Boom, there you go. That was the beginning of civilization. Now we can work on fire and writing and agriculture. That's religion. It's the old sky cake dodge, it worked. But, and by the way, things were great for a while. But then what was happening was that shit was going on all over the planet. They would just use different desserts. They would tell them about sky cookies or sky pie or sky baklava. So as each of these civilizations grew, they'd build ships, they'd go visit each other, and the one guy would walk off the boat and go, hey, did you hear the good news about the sky baklava? And the first guy went, it's cake, motherfucker, you're dead! And then, oh my God, there were the dessert wars. It was a nightmare. They were just killing people. It got so bad that every now and then, some dude would show up and go, hey, I got good news. There's cake and pie and cookies and for everyone. We can all share. And people said, nail him to a fucking cross. It is only cake. Oh my God. The only way sky cake tastes good is if up in the sky, the sky cookie and sky pie people can't have the sky pie. That's the only way sky cake tastes good. I did not spend my life not raping and killing people to not go up in the sky and have cake. Sky cake! So the next time you see some douchebags in front of an abortion clinic or trying to ban a Harry Potter novel, just say, 
Oh, sky cake. Why are you so delicious? <clears throat> Robots. Robots work in my grocery store now. They do. You know how a grocery store works. You bring your items up, and the checkout clerk grabs them, and they wave them over a laser beam, and the laser beam adds them up. You pay the clerk. They put your food in a bag. You take your bag out to the car. Well, with the new grocery robots, you bring the food up to the robot. You wave the food over the laser beam. You pay the robot, you put the food in the bag, and you take the bag out to your car. Because my grocery store got all of my letters where I said, I want to be a checkout clerk. <laughs> so, the, um, and by the way, the, the grocery robots are not zipping around the store, booping and beeping. They are cemented to the ground. They don't leave the store and good for them, because there's badass robots out in the world. These guys would be the prison punks of the robot world. They'd be at the bottom of the ladder. It's like, what kind of robot are you? It's like, I'm a drone plane. I drop bombs over enemy countries. Like, wow, that's awesome. What kind of robot are you? I weld the sides onto aircraft carriers. Holy shit. What kind of robot are you? I know how much kumquats cost. <laughs> Punch. So they are safe in the store, but the first time I saw them, I had my card, I was like, what the hell? I didn't know what they were. And then a, a checkout woman swooped up and said, do you wanna know how this works? Which broke my heart. She's already working as a checkout clerk. And then she came into work that day and the manager said, today your job includes introducing the public to the robots that are putting you on the street. And then my heart broke even worse when she explained. She's like, do you want to know how this works? Yeah, how does this work? Okay, here's how this works. First, I got pregnant in high school. <laughs> then my baby's daddy decided not to leave his wife, but he did stop being my guidance counselor. So none of my transcripts went to college. Now I'm going to take you through the next eight years and 11 seconds. Ready? Meth, meth, meth. Biker boyfriend, dead cop, technicality, rehab, <laughs> Jesus, pharmacy assistant, math! <laughs> Checkout clerk, wave your food over this laser beam and put it in the bag. Do you have any math? <laughs> Do you have any math? No, then we'll end on put your food in this bag. That's how this works. Sad. <laughs> oh, oh, sweet crap. <laughs> I flew here on JetBlue. That's the last airline I will ever fly. I love JetBlue. Oh my God in heaven, it's the best. Because JetBlue, that's the only airline, they've just embraced the fact that flying sucks. It used to be great in the early 60s. Oh my God, men would get dressed up, women would put on a, a nice dress. You could get to the airport 10 minutes before your flight, have a cocktail with a pilot, leave your bag at the gate. <laughs> I'm off to Manhattan, darling. Everybody was a spy. <laughs> now, air travel, you may as well strap a rocket onto the top of a bus and build a ramp and point it towards the city you're going towards. I'm gonna take the rocket bus to Galveston. I got my sweatpants on. I got my half tee that says, who farted? I did. I got a big hefty bag full of popama corn that I made in my house because I love to land in new cities with treasures in my teefers. So JetBlue said, we can't make it better. Let's just distract our passengers. And that's what it is. A JetBlue flight is a long distraction, and it's beautiful. You sit down, there's a screen in front of you. They pipe the shittiest TV shows they can find. It's all the VH1, you know, Flavor of Love, Rock of Love, Brooke Knows Best. It's horrible. And then there's a woman with a basket. She walks around, and the basket is filled with 
sugar, salt, and chocolate. And they just shoved those down your throat for the entire flight with a, with a chimney sweeps brush. Just <laughs> bam, bam, tamping it down into your stomach. By the time you land, your IQ has dropped so low that you're just enchanted you were airborne. It, it, the whole thing was a dream, a daydream. Your friends on the ground go, you flew JetBlue, that must have sucked. And you go, au contraire, we were up in the sky like Superman and the basket lady was there, I had cookies and on TV the whores were punching. <laughs> so happy. Oh, and JetBlue brought back something that I forgot I missed, and that's the live safety demonstration. You know, where the stewardess actually stands up and shows you that, yeah, the seatbelt will fasten like this, and uh, your cushion floats, <laughs> and the tube comes down with air. You can breathe through the tube if you want. See how dead my face is right now? That's her way of saying, none of this shit will save you. You understand? <laughs> Nothing. That should be the safety announcement, by the way. Hi, welcome to JetBlue. Flight 354 will be flying from Burbank to JFK, cruising at an altitude of 40,000 feet for five hours and 50 minutes. If anything goes wrong, you're dead. You understand? <laughs> you're fucking dead. This many people in a metal tube in the sky, this should not be happening. This is against <laughs> nature and God and everything. We, and we do it 100 times a day. So strap in. Let's all pee in God's face for five hours and dare him to kill us. Let's see what happens. Let's dare God to kill us for five hours. I'm gonna give everybody 45 seconds to leave the plane. I'd leave too if I heard what I just said. Nobody, wow, we got a bunch of Vikings here today. Bolt that door, today's a good day to die, Valhalla. Who wants some blue potato chips? The other airlines still show you a video. They make, they make a safety video. That thing is so unnerving because it takes place on this eerie alternate earth where everyone is, the, again, the men are wearing suits and the women have clearly bathed and put on makeup. And you're like, where the fuck is this happening? And everyone's calm and helpful. That's the creepiest part. At one point in the video, the masks come down and everyone's reaction is, oh my, a mask full of the life-giving oxygen I so often take for granted. I should calmly affix that over my mouth and continue doing my Sudoku puzzle. <laughs> Do you know what it means when the masks come down? There's a hole in the plane! Holy shit! If the mask came down in real life, you'd be elbowing the throats of everyone around you grabbing as many masks as you can. Mouth, ears, eyes. I'm the king of breathing. <laughs> the, the plane, I've never done anything smart, calm, or helpful on a plane, ever. <laughs> ever. I want to, but you're just like, here's something I will do. I do this on every single flight. I'll do this going home. You're flying, plane shakes. Oh, there's turbulence. So what do I do now that the plane is shaking? I better uh, look out the window, see what's going on, see if there's <laughs> anything I can do to... Uh, I am certainly the, the master of my fate. I don't just take life as a given. I am very proactive and in control of my existence, so I will see. The f it's there's, there's nothing to see and nothing you can do. It's the one time in your life you can go, oh, nothing I can do. And by the way, what if there was something to see? What if the plane shook, you looked out the window, and a pterodactyl was just banging against the side of the plane? Oh, wow, pterodactyl. I gotta go out in the wing, guys. Give me, um, it's over too quick if I use the nunchucks. Give me, give me three throwing stars and a blindfold. And then, <laughs> if, you, if, you cr if the plane crashes and you live, you won't, they pop, 
the door off the side and they inflate the my special day at Chuck E. Cheese fun slide <laughs> to go down. You get off the plane. So I just, there's no dignity in this at all for me, is there? A slide? God damn it. I just fell 40,000 feet out of the sky in a metal tube filled with jet fuel and I lived. Let me jump off this thing like a green beret. Come on, let me just have some dignity here. I don't need a, I don't need a slide. I've got an archangel looking after me with a sword made of unbaptized babies. Let me go fight crime and expose magicians. Magicians, let me debunk them with my surviving plane crash powers. I'll leave you with something magical. When I started off as a comedian uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, for some reason, I opened up for a lot of comedy magicians. Comedy magicians just ruled the landscape in the early 90s. Because it, back then it was like, hey, are you a shitty comedian? Learn a magic trick. Are you a boring magician? Learn a dick joke. You can make a hundred grand a year. And they did. These guys were the kings. They just ruled. So. Um, I did a one-nighter at a sports bar in Richmond, Kentucky. I did it, and we get there. I'm opening for a comedy magician. I'm getting $25 to open. He's getting $75 to close. I really needed that $25. <laughs> needed it very badly. So we get to the sports bar, and the bartender meets us and says, Brad Booker told you wrong, because the opening guy, you're getting 20 and a magic man, you're just gonna get 70. We've been shorted $5. There's nothing I can do. I need the 20. I'm in. The magician has the ugliest meltdown I've ever <laughs> seen. He doesn't scream and yell either. He does that thing when you get so fucking angry, you begin speaking very quietly, but you over enunciate every word that comes out of your mouth because what you're telling me is the $75 that I was contractually told I would receive has been reduced to $70. Is that what the fuck you're saying? And the bartender's reaction is, yep, that's what the booker said. <laughs> like, he can't see murder when it's an inch from his face. So, the way that a comedy magician worked was, they had a stool on stage, and on the stool, they would put a suitcase, open suitcase, and in the suitcase, they had arranged very neatly all of their magic tricks. And then over here, they had a laundry hamper. And what they would do is, they'd reach into the suitcase, they'd grab a trick. They'd do the trick. They'd do a joke, and eh, John Wayne Bobbitt. They would then take the now <laughs> completed trick and throw it into the hamper. So at the end of the set, stage is not all cluttered. They just grab the hamper, they grab the suitcase, they go off stage, and they reload the suitcase from the hamper, which I've seen happen dozens of times. It's the saddest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it is, it's a Tom Waits song come to life, where it's, <laughs> And the sad old magician is reloading his suitcase. And the one-legged man is fucking horrible. It's horrible. But that's how they did it. I go out. I do my set. Silence. Boo. Thank you. I go off stage. The magician goes out. He is so pissed off at the bartender. Still. Still. Furious. Here's how he does his act. Ready? All right. I got a ball in my hand. Now it's two balls. Now it's three. Now it's one again. Okay. Bam. Now. I got a rope. It's one rope. I snip it in two. It's two. Now it's one again. Okay. Bam. No banter. No jokes. Hate fucked the crowd with magic for 10 minutes. It was fucking amazing. And... What was kind of what kind of sad was he was an amazing magician. He was really good. So there was something really beautiful about that level of skill, just used for petty vengeance. Just a guy, like a wonder worker. Oh, look, it's a rabbit out of a hat, you fucking faggots! Wham. 
And by the way, that was his abracadabra, okay? Okay? Okay. And let's review. What invoked the wrath of the wizard? Five dollars. Five dollars? Really? I thought to piss off a warlock, you had to burn down his village or kill his familiar something. No, all you have to do, steal five dollars from him. 20 quarters, 20 games of Galaga, and he will invoke a... He will invoke a thorny doom from beneath the crust of the earth. Okay! <laughs> the crowd hated him. <laughs> they fucking hated him. Dead silent. Dead silent watching him. I'm in the back of the room laughing so fucking hard. <laughs> So I, could, I was howling. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. So the crowd would watch the magician, then they'd look back at me, <laughs> then they'd look back at the magician like they're trying to piece this together. Is this some kind of avant-garde German theater bullshit where a comedian goes up and he just fucking sucks and then and then a magician goes on and he yells at us and then they dress a lesbian in boys clothing in the back of the room and you realize halfway through, oh, that's that shitty fucking comedian. <laughs> and he's back there cackling in the darkness like a, a half-remembered nightmare through a cracked mirror of regret. Is that what the, because if that's what the fuck this is, I've seen it done better. That's all I'm saying, man. Thank you so much, Washington, D.C. Good night!